Good morning, Breakfast with Bacon fans. I know you're happy to see these three faces on the air. I am so excited always when I can have the Countdown to the Kingdom crew together on my show. Christine Watkins, Daniel O'Connor, Mark Mallett. Everyone says all the time, they might watch my shows, but when are you going to get those guys on the air? I'm like, I know, I know. So I want to welcome them first for coming on to Breakfast with Bacon. And before I tell you what today's show about... What I'd like to say to you is that these three people, all jokes aside, because we're probably going to have a lot of those on the show for a very serious time in our history, is that I consider these three uh, people, three of the holiest people I know. I only know four people, but these are the three holiest people I know. <laughs> but what holy means is to be set apart. And what Christine and Daniel and Mark, I saw them long before I became a part of the team, and I'm so grateful that I did. But to, to be holy means to be set apart, and they are set apart for such a time as this. They have shown many of us, me included, and all of you watching, how and what we are to do in this time in history that is set apart from all the other times in history. So Christine, Daniel, Mark, Thank you again for making time for Breakfast with Bacon and for all of my viewers. I'm so honored to have you here. Well, thank you for making this happen, for having us. I know I'm extremely grateful because it's been way too long since I connected with the crew here. We've, we've all had our own things going on, but we're eager to dive back in full speed as soon as possible. So thank you, Christine. Daniel, I'd like to kind of turn it over to you. There's a really important purpose for today's show. Do you mind telling our viewers? Well, we, we're all in agreement that God is giving us an opportunity right now. We've seen the preview the last few years with what is going to come next. We, we saw a relatively minor preview compared to the persecutions coming next with all the tyranny of the last few years with COVID especially, and that's now died out. And it, it would be quite foolish to think, okay, well, thank goodness that's over. We don't need to worry anymore about about the new world order elites, about about these uh, nefarious plans paving the way for the Antichrist. We don't need to worry about that anymore because now, because now the COVID restrictions are gone. Of course not. Well, what was God doing for that? He was He was giving us a warning, a warning before the warning, perhaps you could say. And what's coming next is way worse, but it's not here just yet. We see the rumblings of it. We see it approaching, but it's not here just yet. So our question now is, what do we do with this window of opportunity that God gives us? And I think it's quite providential that. God has told us exactly what to do in the gospel reading of the day that we're here recording this. Do you mind going with that? Because oh, sure. Yeah, you want me to read that right now? I would love it yeah. because we're going to go with Matthew 5, 13 through 16. Is, is, is actually prophetic as is everything in the Bible. I think so. Yeah. Let me, I've got it here on my laptop. Let me just read it. Jesus said to his disciples, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its taste, with what can it be seasoned? It is no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city set on a mountain cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and then put it under a bushel basket. It is set on a lampstand where it gives light to all in the house. Just so your light must shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your heavenly father. Amen. Our light must shine before others in these days. And I think in one simple phrase, that's what Jesus is especially saying to the devout, the remnant faithful right now. Let that light shine before others. Before I turn it over to Mark and Christine, Mark, uh, you and Daniel had done the series that so many of us had seen on the seven seals. And and of course, if you don't mind me recapping, we talked about the time of mercy and then the peace is shattered economic collapse, social collapse, minor persecution, and then the warning before we get the reprieve of, of six and a half weeks. And I've had people saying to me, maybe the warning's coming tomorrow, M maybe soon. I hope it's coming soon. And I'm going, wait, guys, wait. All of those things have to happen before the warning. So whether they all happen kind of like boom, boom, boom at the same time or separately, and there's a kind of a, a break in between each, We've got a lot that's got to happen before the warning. But um, as Daniel was saying, in the meanwhile, because all the people are saying, well, you know, what do we do? What do we do until then? 
how do you guys say to, to be the salt of the earth? Because it's up to us, as was just read in the gospel, to get other people there, to get other people to heaven, to get other people ready for the warning. What sayeth you? Are we spot on on this? Um, well, I think just addressing your, your first point, um, Christine, um, the the image that the Lord gave me many years ago was that there was a great storm coming upon the earth like a hurricane. That was the word that almost launched my writing miss apostolate in 2006. And then it was shortly after that that I opened up the book of Revelation chapter 6 with all the seven seals. And the word that I got as I began to read was, this is the great storm. So if it's like a hurricane, these seals that we've talked about on our webcast of hyperinflation, you know, economic collapse, war, of course, uh, famine, and now we're seeing it's a man-made famine, man-made plagues. I mean, I think most of these seals are actually just simply man-made, man creating a great storm. And this is very much in line with the Masonic philosophy, which is uh, out order out of chaos. So they know what they're doing. Um, I mean, you hear someone like Prince Charles and others, they they speak in these terms that we need to be on a, a warlike footing. I mean, we're all just sitting here going to our eight to five jobs doing our thing. And these guys are like a warlike footing, you know, it's like, well, COVID was the whole thing was a war on humanity. There's no question as we look back and and as Daniel just said previously, this was a precursor. This is not it. There's more coming. So to answer your question is if you think of it like a hurricane well a hurricane is constantly spinning and you're getting closer to the eye of the storm so uh, you know i don't know like is the is the second seal uh of war is that fully opened or is it yet a major event that thrusts us forward i'm kind of suspecting the latter but i don't know um hyperinflation uh, you know, the third seal, which is what, uh, uh, you know, a day's wages buys a bushel of, of barley or whatever it is in the, in that in that seal. It, we're seeing hyperinflation right now. So is that seal fulfilled or is there yet to be something huge, which was a which is a major economic collapse? So I, I think the answer in part is that it's like a hurricane. So it just keeps coming around. These winds keep spiraling and it just keeps getting worse. And we just keep seeing it over the years getting worse and worse until I think we finally reach the culmination, which is eventually going to be a singular moment, which is the warning, the sixth seal. Um, so yeah, we're, we're living in a time where I think uh, even though it's difficult to see these things happening, more and more people are being affected by this war. They're being, the winds are lashing them and more and more people are starting to see there's something fundamentally wrong uh, with what's going on. And that to me, is the opportunity to salt the conversations to become light in the world and and i'm not even sure it, it, it part of it speaking about the signs of the times but we're, we're also people are incredibly wounded right now and they just need love they need to encounter jesus through us and i think unconditional love the power of the holy spirit flowing through us which is something we can't create it has to come from an authentic life in jesus and I think this is why I'm just guessing my colleagues are as tired as I am right now because Satan is relentless. He's attacking us in our families, our marriages, our relationships. Uh, it's coming from all ends to get us off of being of the vine, so to speak, to get us displaced from being in Jesus. Because Jesus himself said, unless you're on the vine, you can do nothing. So if if he's disturbing our prayer life, if he's disturbing uh, our ability to remain in him, to resist sin and all these things, we we start to dry up as a grape, <laughs> one that, who can bear fruit. And so I, I think for those of you who are Christians right now, we need to pay attention to this, to not be discouraged, to come back to the Lord, to begin again. It doesn't matter what you've done, how many times you've done it, how bad you've fallen. Heck, I'm a sinner like everybody else here. And the my only answer is to begin again. It's just to go back to confession and to start praying again and start loving again in the context of our homes and our families and forgiving ourselves. And I think once we start doing that, then the love of Jesus can really begin to flow and, and everything we're doing then begins to carry his presence, 
even when we're not saying anything. And that's that's really the beginning of the most powerful evangelization is when I can be in a room and and people are being influenced by me even subconsciously because the love and presence of power of Jesus is flowing through me. And, and then the words then that follow, people have our attention. That's called being an authentic Christian. And then our words are, you know, what it was Paul the Sixth who said, the best evangelists, the best apostles are uh, witnesses, are uh, best teachers are witnesses. So those who best teach the faith are those who actually witness it. And this, this is why that last sentence in the gospel is so important that your light, light must shine that they may see your good deeds and glorify your heavenly father. And so this means being authentic with my wife, authentic with my children, authentic with those in my community and my readers. And so this is a moment, I think this is the examination of conscience. And then the Christine and Daniel can do the rest of the show. So <laughs> we need to examine where we we're kind of falling away from the Lord. And I tell you, I, I I'm, I'm personally, I'm in a huge war right now with the enemy and he's doing everything he can to unseat me. And uh, when people said they're praying for me, I'm like, I'm so grateful. I mean, don't, don't get me wrong. It's not like I'm, I'm out walking the streets looking for prostitutes or something heinous like that. But I mean, in, in just my personal balance and order and even in the harmony in my home, it's just a, it's a war. Yes. And uh, so I, I'm just having to constantly come back to the basics again. And, uh, and, and I, I'm, I'm sharing that with you because I, I think, you know what you said at the beginning, God bless you, but you know, uh, are we holy? We're certainly set apart. Am, am I holy? I don't know. Spend an hour with me. <laughs> Let me ask your wife. <laughs> yeah. Ask my wife and she'll tell you, she'll be honest with you. She's a good person. <laughs> Uh, I, that was beautiful, Mark. What a what a great introduction to the show, because I don't want to say this. Well, you all might want to share where I get my inspiration from. <laughs> but I was inspired recently in a certain room in my home. Um, <laughs> does it have toilet? Does it have paper hanging? No, on no, the wall? this is the PG thirteen part There's of the lots show. Lots of toilet paper in that particular room, and. Um, where well, so, most inspiration comes from it's okay who knows how much of the bible is written you know <laughs> i didn't mean to say that no. saint yes. paul is where you get good work fact, done sometimes back, when you have back. kids it's the only place you can it's get the away only from place the and yeah. so um i got the sense uh mary was saying please mention the things that keep us in that state of grace as a light as light and salt for the world the way mark was describing uh, the enemy is attacking all four of us and you out there, I'm sure very harshly. And because where sin abounds, um, we also have where grace abounds all the more. So thank God we have massive amounts of grace available to us, but we have to do the things that open the doors to that grace to come in. And there are five things that Mary is pleading for us to do and to continuously do or else we do get derailed and they are daily prayer especially the rosary at least monthly confession frequent reception of the eucharist um fasting ideally on bread and water on wednesdays and fridays and continuously reading the scripture and diving into the bible so if you have those five things memorized and you look at all five and you say I'm not doing all of those, then there's something missing. And the one that people tend to chuck is fasting. They say, oh yeah, I can go yes. to confession more frequently. I can make it to mass more. I can crack open the Bible. I can pr pull out a rosary, but don't make me give up my treats. So if you can't fast on bread and water on Wednesdays and Fridays, find something else. You know, you know your health, you know, you know better than anyone, you and God, what your body can and can't handle and what's sustainable. But we really are in times where certain demons will not leave. They will not leave us. They will not leave our families. They will not leave our communities. They won't unless we fast in addition to our prayer. For some and, reason. Oh, go ahead. So, I, yeah, I really wanted to say that. I also, before I forget, uh, after the warning, we're talking about this period of time preceding the warning. 
And a lot of you have asked for something to hand to people after the warning so that they know what just hit them. So just want you to know I'm in, um, I have this brochure available. Um, I'm going to pretend to hold it up right now because it's not in front of me. <laughs> I'm going to do some AI thing right now. Later on, yeah, there we go. Photoshop there it now. is. Um, <laughs> that you can have at your disposal um, and just pass it out. I wanted to make it very easy for you. So just wanted you to know that that's available. And what we'd like to talk about in this show are simple and practical ways for us to take that light that hopefully remains within us and share that light with the world. And I have a little story of what happened yesterday about the enemy attacking the family. But Christine, I'm sorry, did you want to say something? No, I want you to go into that because that's more important. My because story? Oh, well the story you're going to tell because if i know where you're going to go as everybody watching knows i i not i but the lord through me has given me the vocation of saving marriages for a living and the things that are coming that people are talking about are good holy people people who want their marriages to be good and the things that satan is using against them is is there's a particular I don't know. I don't know how to articulate it here, but there's something different about. Let me go to these points in your in your marriage. These resentments between a husband and a wife. Um, to to, I can't name them here, but they're very particular and different than what I'm used to seeing. And I've only been seeing this in the past two, three years, all of a sudden going attack this family. And these are good, holy marriages, good, holy people who have already been here in their I desire to please you, God, I would like to die for you. And now, you know, Lord is going, Satan's getting those people here. So I think I haven't even asked you guys, but again, I think we all alluded to the fact that Satan is definitely going to start with the domestic church. I am, He's seeing, that start... ex I am seeing that exploding. Go ahead recently. with that. Yeah. Well, yeah. Exploding. Absolutely. So <laughs> maybe we each have our stories of marriage and family nightmares, but <laughs> go ahead, Christine, we'll let you start with that. Yes, I, I, I think I have the most. I... You have three sons. It's impossible to have peace in your house. Okay. So I'll, I'll try to make this brief. So two days ago, my I have a, a six-year-old, a 14-year-old, and a 19-year-old. And the six-year-old and the 14-year-old are, are still with me at home. And the six-year-old, he said, I don't want to do piano lessons anymore. So I said, okay. So I exorcise him right away. No. <laughs> <laughs> I brought the priest. No. So he was saying, You're playing the organ. He said, so he was complaining, too much handwork, too much handwork. I want to do cello. I want to do flute. I want to do something else. I'm not doing piano. And and, he, and I said, Well, I said, the cello, yeah, it has this hand. I said, Honey, but it also has this hand. He goes, What? I said, Yeah. I said, I said, Every instrument is going to have you move your fingers. And it got him thinking, I still don't want to do piano. Okay, no piano. Night before the piano lesson, which is the night before last, he says, I'm, I said, okay, I'm going to call your piano teacher. We're canceling the lessons. And he goes, stop. I want to do piano. I said, okay, we're, we're doing piano. I pick him up from his aftercare program yesterday. Why are you picking me up? I said, because we're doing piano. I don't want to do piano. <laughs> I said, look, I said, you decided to do piano. That's why I'm picking you up. Please get in the car. We get in the car. We go to piano. He loves the piano lesson. Afterwards, I say, you want to keep piano? Yeah, I want to keep piano. Okay, fine. The schedule for that day was to go from there to swimming and then to confession because our church has Monday night confessions. We get in the car to go to swimming. I don't have my cell phone. My 14-year-old uh, has his. It's not working. He goes, I don't know. I said, I don't know where to go for this swim meet. He said, I don't, my phone's not working. I said, well, we got to go home and get the phone because I don't know where to swim. And the, the kid in the back's like. <laughs> so he's like constant. He's not, he's going to yell the whole way through. Then my 14 year old starts yelling at me. Why don't you get me a phone that works? Okay. <laughs> We, I have to drive all the way home. By the time we get to the swim meet, there's three minutes left. In the whole meet? <laughs> so I like pushing it. And my kid's like, I need to get in the water. So I basically shove him in the water. I'm like, spend your three minutes in the water. He's like, he's like having a ball. I'm, la, da, 
no, he thinks it's a swimming lesson. It's not, but that it doesn't matter. Perception is everything. We get out of there. We go back home. My son's like, I'm not going to confession. I said, but, 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 but we, we, we had it planned that you, you would go to, confession. I'm not going. He gets in his bed, pulls over the cover, puts the cat on top of him, not going. I was like, well, I, but, I'll give you a phone that works if you go to confession. Really? <laughs> Gets out of bed. We go to confession. And then I was like, go in adoration before confession. No. You got to get close to Jesus. No. I'm fine where I am. Jesus is close <laughs> enough. I'm like, no, no, no. You got And he goes, no, I'm not going in there. I said, why not? She, he said, because the, the lady's going, Hail Mary, full of grace. Her, her prayer is bothering me. And there's a, a, a fluorescent light that's buzzing. I can't go in there. <gasps> so I go in there. I turn off the fluorescent light noise. In Spanish, I'm speaking to the kindly. I'm like, my 14-year-old, mi, mi, mi hijo quería rezar aquí y no quiere ruido. Ah, I see. No hay problema. I come out. I've got that set up. The chapel is just the way you want it. Go in there. He goes in. He's like, mom, I fell asleep the whole time. I'm like, fine. You were just near Jesus. That's fine. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I have to get him a whole new phone now. What have I done? <laughs> and then we, we come in and then, so we're about to leave the chapel. My six-year-old by this time has decided that he's had it. So he's like, why is everybody torturing me? I am the victim of every crime. He said that? Pretty yeah. standard six year old. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm the victim of every crime. And I thought, wow. Worst mom so, in the whole so, world. <laughs> so then my my 14 year old made it to confession after his adoration. And so I felt like, I don't know. I almost felt like maybe everything that came out of my 14 year old went into my six year old on the way home because he just became the victim of every crime for a half hour. And, a and that soul. was, that was last night. So there's last peace in night. your home. Wow. That was last night. <laughs> so I just, I'm sharing because, you know, you see these little picture postcard perfect catholic families and they're praying together and they all have their hands like this and, and those are you postcards kind of, yeah. exactly they, they kind don't of get a size because they couldn't wow. even take a picture yeah that doesn't exist in reality so if you if you're sitting there wondering man what the heck is wrong with me and my family it's it's your uh, the families out there who are the you know the public images they're going through the exact same things so the point yeah. the, the moral of the story is persevere Yes. I know so many families looking at their issues thinking, all right, it's time to give up. It is not time to give up. I solemnly assure you, if you're thinking of walking out on your spouse or something like that, that is from the devil. I, I assure you that infallibly. Okay. That's it. Hold on. Hold on to your marriage. <laughs> Hold on to your family. Persevere. The, 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 the end of the road, you know, the, the, the prize is coming soon enough. Jesus is asking you to persevere though. Yeah. You are stronger as a team than you are apart. And that's why Satan is working his butt off to uh, working his wings off uh, to um, divide you, to divide you, to get you to give up. I mean, I know people talk about, oh, the Latin mass people are holier. And I mean, I go to Latin church Monday through Saturday and I go to Novus Ordo on Sunday and I see the same things in both. I see these holy, you know, families at the Latin church with six or seven or 10 kids and they're dealing with the same problems and they're fighting so hard for their marriages and their families. And I'm like, Daniel, what you just said is exactly it. Persevere. Do not give up. It is hard. And I'm not even with them pretending that it's easy. Uh, you know, some of the things that I've seen, my heart breaks, um, you know, restraining orders and, and um, you know, just, yeah. just things oh, that are, I've this isn't make believe yeah. stuff. This it's, is right. tough. I, I've seen, and I can't, I, I can't go into detail because I'm not at, at liberty to share what this is about, but I, I've recently observed the most uh, unbelievable situation in a, in a devout Catholic marriage that you wouldn't imagine. I, it was, you never would have seen this coming. And yet it, be, it very quickly became the worst, worst situation you could almost even think of. Mm -hmm. And we were just begging God for, for his intercession for this family and mm -hmm. out of nowhere, just healing I, I wouldn't have believed that, that this healing would have happened overnight what what we observed in, in response to prayer for this couple so 
you think your situation is desperate or, or irreconcilable or unfixable, that is a lie from the pit of hell. Whatever you're going through now, God can fix it overnight if that's his will. And maybe it's not his will, it's overnight. Maybe it's his will, it'll take a long period of healing. But, I, but what I do assure you is that it can be fixed and it can be healed. And through his grace, it will be if you keep seeking it. The perseverance that you're learning through the domestic struggles you guys have I believe, and maybe you guys can speak to this, is is training for the perseverance we're going to need when all of this stuff happens. I mean, this, mm -hmm. this uh, economic collapse, social collapse, rioting, things. We are being strengthened. The more you weaken your flesh, you strengthen your spirit. And that's why perseverance is absolutely huge during these times. It's it's training. It's a training ground. Mark, was it you or Daniel earlier that says we're on a we're on a battlefield or uh, the war games. Didn't one of you say that? Well, yeah. Oh. Yeah. And I think that's a valid way of looking at what we had to endure for the last few years is like the devil's war. In a post a while ago, I called it um, the the uh, the dress. I called the cold COVID tyranny a dress rehearsal for the Antichrist. And that's valid enough. But I think actually a better analogy would be that it's it was a dress rehearsal. That's what I said. And I think a better analogy would be that it was like a, a war game. So the devil is not omnipotent. He's not omniscient. He has to kind of learn and figure things out. He doesn't know everything. So with COVID, he was kind of testing the waters with all that tyranny that he inspired the institution of. And I think he learned a few things during the COVID tyranny, and he's going to apply those lessons he learned in the next tyranny. And, and I'm still kind of investigating this and, and, and thinking about it before I put my thoughts out there full blown. But I think one of the things he learned is that he's got to move faster. People caught on to the COVID tyranny in a way that he wasn't expecting. And I think the next tyranny is going to explode into the world so quickly that we're not going to have any time to, to modify our own response. We're just, it's going to be like right into refuges at that point, which is why I think this time we're in right now is so utterly key. This window of opportunity we have. I think always about the, uh, the line from the Lord of the Rings where I think it's Gandalf. He says, we're in the deep breath before the plunge. You look out in the, I think this was it. I, I'm not a Lord of the Rings nerd, so I'm going to misquote this. I mean, we don't believe you. <laughs> I promise <laughs> I'm not. Deep but they're looking out. He doesn't see the armies coming. No, no one sees the armies coming. You can't see them if you physically look out. And so, so you could just go about your days pretending all is well, that, the, that all the chaos that just happened, it's just over and done with. But no, if, if you have an honest assessment of the way things are. You know that it's about to burst forth again. You just don't see it physically in front of you, but you realize it's about to come. So this deep breath that the devil's taking, that his minions are taking, he's doing that because he needs it. Because again, he's not God. He's not omniscient. He needs to fine tune the strategy. The question is, what do we do with that same period of time? And what we do is, as we said in the beginning, we get his mercy out there because you have no idea. You probably need it. I know I need it. But you have no idea how much you can do to get his mercy out there and how easy it is you, you take that our lady's admonitions the five stones you remain in god's grace and you don't have to go out and get a degree in apologetics and memorize every argument for how to bring people into the faith in fact you can ignore all that stuff i mean there's nothing wrong with it it's, it's good to it's good to know a few answers but really all you need is openness that's all you need is, is being in, in god's grace seeking to live in his will and then just making yourself available in a posture of openness to whatever the Holy Spirit might present. And you'll be amazed at what he does through you. Amazed. You know, I, what's coming to mind, and, and I wonder if it's okay to, to point to where this is steering in this show is perseverance amidst brokenness, mm -hmm. kind of what I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. um, and to give an example of that, and maybe if you're all okay with it, maybe we'll stick with that topic. Uh, on this show, but one hour before this show, and you heard what my evening was like yesterday. I went to mass this morning and I said, okay, my, my 14 year old needs community. He can't be lying in bed with his cat on his stomach all day. I, you know, I just sat there in mass saying this, I need help for both these children. And I got out of mass and there were kids doing a vacation Bible school, making too much noise um, outside the mass. And I looked around and I asked some questions and this lady was walking up and I started chatting with her because I felt compelled to. 
And I told her about my son's situation. I said, we're, you know, we're kind of isolated here in terms of a teen and needing community and needing faith. And she goes, I know exactly what you mean. In COVID, I was, you know, on bed rest with my three children. We were locked up for a year. I know what it's like to need connection for your teen. And we looked at each other. And by the end of talking to her for an hour, she was now my new best friend. And we have three different activities that my son can join, whereas a moment, a split second before that, I had nothing for him. I hadn't been able to find anything for him to connect with for months. And then God went Foo, and gave it to me right after I asked for it this morning at mass. So I think that's this microcosm of my last few hours of life really talks about brokenness, like the chaos in the families, the chaos in our lives and trying to hold it together as you see things kind of around you just spinning out of control and then going deep and saying, please, you, you've got to fix this. You've got to provide something. But, and then once again, we have to do our part. I had to walk out and talk to that lady. I had to go to mass. If I hadn't done those things, God couldn't have given me what he wanted to give me. We do our part and we persevere, not knowing when or how he's going to show up, but keep on, keep on, keep on. Amen. Mark, you and I recently did a show and then you've done this fantastic series that talked about the retreat that you went to. And so I, I know that we're not going to redo the whole show, but there was perseverance there was something you were learning in this silent retreat and and I believe that that was part of what's preparing you for what lies ahead because beforehand it was just so much busyness and so many lies and so much distortion from the enemy and so do you mind kind of encapsulating here how that applies because now you have felt the Holy Spirit tell you that you are the watchman one of several maybe but you are the watchman so to sit back and, and allow yourself the silence to not only watch and see what's happening, but then to also hear how God is, is telling you what to hear and then what to tell us. How, how has that helped you? And how is that applying to this time right here, right now that we are in this kind of reprieve that Daniel said? Well, yeah, in 2002, Pope John Paul II called all the youth to become watchmen who announced the coming of the risen Christ. So it, it wasn't just me. It, it's, it's hopefully a generation that's watching and praying. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's an interesting place that I'm in right now because of, of, you know, um, I, I don't know if we discussed this last time, but I, I think we did, but about how the gifts and call of God are irrevocable, as it says in, in uh, one of Paul's writings, the gifts and call of God are irrevocable. And I I see that as, as each of the people on this program right now are, are called to a specific ministry. And God has equipped us to do this ministry. When we go to do that ministry, there's grace to do that ministry. But that is, to a certain degree, separate from our personal lives. So I can tell you that when I sit down to write the now word, it's, it's like I come into a place... Uh, where uh, there's just grace, where where I'm I'm becoming a secretary in a sense, and I'm just taking dictation from the Lord as to what He wants to say to His people. But when I come out of that, I'm still responsible for my own spiritual life, my, my the spiritual life of my family, and I, and I'm just seeing right now how the Lord is saying, just because you might be called to do this, doesn't mean that you're going to even be saved. I mean, this this is an extraordinary uh, thing to be faced with. And you remember St. Paul said in the book of James, or sorry, James did. He said, not all of you are called to be teachers because you will be judged more harshly. And so like a lot. Jesus said, yeah, Jesus said, uh, not all who say, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do my will. And uh, and then we hear others say, Lord, we cast out demons in your name. We did all these things. And he says, I don't know you. And so we're at a time right now where, where the big picture is that God is preparing for himself a bride who will be without spot or blemish. And he is bringing us into the divine will to live in the divine will. And so this is a state of being of, of the sanctity of sanctities. And so if we think we're going to come into that sanctity of sanctities, 
with all of the stuff we're clinging to now, all of the dysfunction and brokenness now, then we are deceived. And I, and I don't want to say that in the sense to create an idea that God is saying, you know, I'm there's no way you're getting into the divine will. No, no, no. This is God's love and mercy saying, I want to purify you. So I think what's happening in Christian marriages, what's happening in Christian families, and I'm experiencing it in my own realm as well. We're finding all our weaknesses, all the areas where we've compromised, where we are, we have judgments, where there's brokenness, where there's woundedness. The Lord is letting this now come to the surface. And it's like dysfunction one-on-one is, you know, we're having to face it. And so, you know, I'm sitting down with my sons. <laughs> I have I have a meeting plan with one of my sons to sit down. He so he can tell me about my about the father wounds I've caused him, right? It's like I can see that he's he's got hurts and you know, he's a he's a ministry kid. One of his kids who grew up in a ministry, you know, and Daniel and I think Christine will understand what I'm talking about, where we get so preoccupied with helping to save souls and bring them to Christ that sometimes our own families, even though we're trying to lead them in prayer and these things, we almost feel it, you almost feel like you come out of your ministry and they're just going to absorb by osmosis everything you're doing. And they don't. They really actually don't care in some respects about my ministry. They just care that you're you're a good dad, that you're there as a dad that I need and you're loving me and doing what you need to do as a dad. And so I'm sorry for the long answer, but I I think the big picture is God is purifying us and that all of this brokenness and stuff is actually not a bad thing that's coming out. I mean, it's, it's pretty serious. And I agree with you. We're seeing good and holy marriages being tried and tested. And my wife, Lee, and I will tell you that we too are having to start over and over again as we can confront our own weaknesses with each other after 32 years of marriages. But I mean, we, we held each other yesterday and said, we need to just love. We need to love in every word. We need to love in every action. And if we do that for one another, like our, our lives together will be beautiful. It will be love. So anyway, I'm kind of all over the map right now. But, no, you're um, not. That's perfect. Yeah. Because what you just said, what Daniel, all you guys just said, if I could sum that up, is that in order to be ready, for this next phase of what's going to happen in the world in order for us to be the salt and light for us to lead people who are not even Christian or Catholic, who after the warning are going to be like, uh, and we're going to have to instruct God is burning off our rough edges. He's burning off the, the filth, the, the darknesses in each of us. And in order to do that, it has to rise to the top. So God is letting us see Mark through your son, Christine, through your sons. I mean, our marriages, he's saying, okay, Christine Bacon, you've got to work on these areas. I, I know he tells me a lot that I need to be gentle, um, always working on humility. Um, what are the areas that need to bless not only my marriage, but others? And I need to work on it in my marriage, in my family first, so that I can give it to others. That kind of speaks to what all of you are going through. Is that not true? Yeah. God works yeah. all things to the good for those who love him. If you have to start from a clean slate every other day, praise God. All that matters is that you recognize that before you die. So you, know, you don't ever waste a second lamenting the past. The past is God's. He let it happen because it was his will. Jesus, I, I love this line that Jesus tells the servant of God, Luis Picaretta. He says, to think, that, to, and he means this in a certain sense, of course, but the, the thought of the past is absurd. It's like wanting to claim divine rights. In other words, what has, what God has allowed to happen was part of a plan. And I always want to remind people of that, but sometimes I hesitate because I, because I sense that they can't even handle hearing that when they're going through these great trials where, where they think that they're, where they're almost tempted to think they're lost or something when they're clearly not, that, that, that even this is part of a plan to make things better than they were before this seeming tragedy happened. And yes, it is, I'm sure whatever you're going through, if you're struggling, it is a tragedy in one sense, but not in the sense, not in another sense, not in the sense that God is working something greater through this. If you love him, then it's a fact that this is part of a plan for your good. And, and, and I believe that if you're bothering to listen to this, you do love him. And, 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 if, you, and if you're wondering if you do love him, tell him you do. And if you if you meant that, then you do. There's there's not some mystery. There's not some mysteries about what, as to whether you love him or not. If you make an act of the will, sincerely seeing to love him, then you love him. And if that's if you've done that, then everything that he that he is allowed to happen is part of his plan for the good. And you need to hold on to that and keep moving forward in it. 
and cleaning our hearts out and our lives out in the midst of the brokenness, I I felt convicted by something I I said and that I was saying I would get my son a new iPhone. I, I really want to flesh that out because his phone is extremely restricted and will be again. And I think that some people are aware, but not enough that that is a portal. Yes. The iPhone, the internet, the iPad, it's all a portal for what is to come. And it is the new church for our children. It's where they go for comfort. It's where they go for connection. It's where they go to feel alive. It's not church anymore. It's not silence anymore. It's the noise of whatever technological device. And if you can imagine, so there are other people on the other side of the screen who want our children. And what they really want is to get them addicted to something. Video games, pornography, social media, checking to see who likes them, checking to see who contacted them. It, so Daniel just spoke of love, getting in touch with love. Love comes in the silence and through a person and through nature and through all these things. It, it can come through technology if one is watching good, holy content and Technology should be used for evangelization, and, and we're doing that now. But by and large today, technology will be used by the enemy. So if you have given your kid a device freely and without restrictions, sorry to offend, I've made my own mistake, so I, I am not condemning, that was a mistake. And you have to undo right now what you did because something, I, I assure you, <laughs> the average age that the kid is introduced to pornography is 11 years old. And parents don't want to think of their children as sexual beings. Um, parents don't want to think of their children as someone who would go back out of curiosity to look something up. But they've done studies, and, I, and I'm sorry that I can't cite exactly what study it was, but... <laughs> I know it's been done that if a child is introduced to pornography without their parents having explained what it is and gone through a whole session in pre-puberty years before they get hit by puberty, 100% of the time, those kids will search up what was just what they stumbled upon. 100% of the time. So, and they will lie and they will feel ashamed and they will not tell us and all that. But I mean come on, you go on any internet site and there's going to be a lingerie ad on the side, you know, anything, anything at all is a portal. Um, so, and video games are a portal to anger and disobedience and addiction and inability to focus and ADHD symptoms. There's a child should only have so much screen time. It literally rewires the brain. And so many kids and adults are healed of mental disorders, mental troubles with a six week tech break. Wow. Suddenly all their symptoms go away. So please be very restrictive of your child's use of technology, what sites they're allowed to go on to. You have to get help. If you can't figure it out, you have to find someone who can do the blocking for you. If you can't figure it out, you have to take the device away and then your child will want to kill you. Yeah. And then you and have to okay. deal with potential murder in the home. And I understand <laughs> that. Um, Fear not that those who can kill the body, but can I kill <laughs> <Exactly>. the soul? <laughs> so, that's You can't live, you, you can't parent out of fear. You can't think, oh, if I take this away from my kid, he's going to hate me. He's gonna... All right. If, if you don't take it away, it's going to hate you more. So take it away. Or if they hate you or love you, but they go to hell. I mean, yeah. isn't that a bigger right? Concern? So just don't even think about it. Like, don't even think about letting a kid browse the internet. That's absurd. Yeah. I mean, it is it is a cesspit of evil. You're barely ready for that once you're an adult, and a kid certainly is not. You need to every single every single shot, every single thing that goes on a screen in front of your kid's eyes. You need to know. 
Yeah. It, is, it, it cannot be a secret. It cannot be hidden. You need to know exactly. And it needs to have your explicit permission before it goes before one of your kid's eyes. And I, 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 I advocate for an absolutely hard line on that, no exceptions. And check your thing. responses. If your kids don't feel that they can trust your response, they aren't going to share with you. My grandson right. has a deep trust in me. And he was seven years old when he told me he saw, um, it was oral sex came up and he didn't even know what it was. And I was sickened in my, in my gut. And one of the things that, um, the way that they do it is one of his favorite shows to watch back then. I'm not the parent. I'm the grandparent was Assassin's Creed. And so they would type in the letters A S S just to get that. And all they had to do is type those first three letters and right. things popped up. And so he immediately felt bad because he felt like it wasn't good. Um, but it wasn't his fault. And so they were kind of didn't want to tell us. And so opening up and being able to say, you know, Logan, that's that's not your fault. Let me tell you why that happens. And so let yourself be a safe place for your children to say the kind of things that they've seen and, and work with them. My husband, and, and I don't care if you guys believe me or not, I really don't care. We're going to be having our 40th wedding anniversary this August has never had an issue with pornography or, or that kind of thing. And just because all my husband ever looks on YouTube is is holy videos of preachers and, and stuff like this. And just the other day he had a video and an image come up of a sex toy on his. And I'm like, he doesn't even go to places that should have it. It's just so bold. And whereas people like the four of us are getting kicked off of this social media platform for so-called hate speech or offending. And then you get stuff like that. That's not even restricted. It's just Satan at his best. It, it baffles us. So, um, I know that there's more that we each want to say, but you're going to do it in this context because we're running towards the end of the showtime. So I want to say to each of you, um, in terms of what we open the show with, this is a, a time of reprieve where all the enemy is regrouping to get us even harder than he did before. We need to be the salt and light of the earth. We need to be prepared. We need to be doing something. And so I'm going to ask each of you, Name one thing you'd have our viewers do differently as a result of something we talked about today to get them ready. I don't care who goes first. If I touch my nose, that means I don't have to go first, right? Isn't that the one? <laughs> 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 well, no. um, I, I think um, I, I think uh, we have to realize that that we're at a time right now where Satan is becoming. He's revealing himself exactly as Jesus said, a liar and the father of lies and a murderer from the beginning, Jesus said. So that's who he is. He's a liar and a murderer from the very beginning. So he, I, I think the one, if you really step back from this show and we really, we didn't plan this show. Uh, if we did have plans, I think we did have plans and we were totally off because the Holy Spirit wanted to talk about the family right now, how the family is under attack. So we've talked about technology and all these things. And I, I think we have to realize Satan is lying to us. He's He's got bald faced lies. And I think what we're seeing in marriages and, and I'm encountering this in my own family is how the, the enemy can come in and create these lies and these judgments through lies that, you know, so-and-so doesn't understand me or so-and-so feels this way about me. And I, I think this is what's happening now with families is there's these cracks in there and, and, and genuine wounds and fallen nature and sins and so on, using these to create very powerful judgments. And we're living in a culture, right? It's a victim culture. So, you know, as Christine said, you know, I'm the victim of every crime. And we, we get this mentality now where we're, it, it, there's a warped sense of justice so it, right now in our culture everybody is seeking justice you know justice for you know black justice uh this kind of justice gender justice and all these things and i think this this, this is creeping into the family too where my wife might have said something and i feel unjust it was unjust or my child might feel that i did something and vice versa and these judgments are being created which are extremely powerful so powerful they can destroy families so this is what my advice would be to those of you who are watching these good and holy marriages and families that are under siege um just like mine is under siege right now because we're we're and we're working through them but some aren't working through them and this, this is where it goes really bad yeah 
is you need to forgive. First of all, you need to, as Daniel said earlier, the past is the past. So if you've hurt somebody in the past and they bring it up to you, we need to own it. So the second thing is I think we need to see these lies are amplifying. So if you take a microscope right now and you, you, you know, or your iPhone and you put the magnifier on and your skin, you're going to be horrified. It just looks horrible. <laughs> But this is what it's happening right now is all our faults and everything are getting put through judgments under a magnifying glass. So suddenly something your wife said or something your husband said or kid said, Satan is magnifying it. So it looks really awful. And then these judgments, if we're allowing them to come in, are taking root. And St. Paul warned, he said, let no bitter root uh, spring up among you. And these bitter roots are happening now in relationships and in families. And so we need to forgive. We need to really forgive. We need to look at our spouses and recognize that we all have faults. We need to, kids need to look at their parents, recognize their faults. And we need to exercise the mercy of Christ toward one another. We need to forgive and we need to renounce those lies. Uh, you know, you can imagine the kinds of lies Satan is throwing at. Oh, I shouldn't have married this spouse. Uh, you know, my kids don't love me. I mean, these are all the kinds of things that that, that they th we Satan throwing at families right now. And we need to confront them and say, no, that's not true. And I reject that lie. And I forgive my spouse. And we need to ask forgiveness. And as Daniel said earlier, and I agree, we need, and, and this is what I'm doing in my own situation, is it's just beginning again. You have to begin again and love again. And how many times? Jesus said 77 times, seven times. So that means over and over again. Now, if you keep, if you're in a situation where your house, husband or your wife is really abusive and they refuse to, I mean, that's a different situation, right? You have to, you have to get out of the house and get safe, yeah, right? Remove yourself from a situation like that. But we're talking where there's, there's disagreements. And if you need to go to a counselor, go to a counselor and talk it out, get it out because families are under attack. So, um, you know, this is just a general thing I'm giving about where you need to go right now if you want to win this battle against your marriage and your family and so on. Is it starts with forgiveness over and over again until these lies start to really come to the surface and they die, and you put them to death and you replace them with service and kindness and gentleness and bearing one another's burdens. It's the only way forward. Yeah, that's awesome. And I want to. Um put a plug in right now for Christine Bacon has a beautiful ministry for broken marriages and for people, especially who are standers who've had a spouse who has left and they're not willing to uh, forfeit the marriage because of what their spouse is doing. So um, I'm going to, she does a great job. It's a, it's a ministry that God has given to her. Um, it's, yeah. it's, imbued in the Holy Spirit. She works through the Holy Spirit. She has a passion for this. Um, and she's been through her own hell in marriage. She she knows of what she speaks. So I really encourage people, if you're watching this and you feel like your marriage, you know, let's say you are still together, but you need help. Christine Bacon is, is a, a wonderful resource. And Christine, I hope at the end, you'll um, share that with the audience, but also uh, piggybacking on something Mark just said at the beginning is there are justice issues. You know, there is, you know, he mentioned black injustice and, and gender injustice and things like that. And those are real things. We're not saying that there isn't racial discrimination. We're not saying that there is, there are terrible prejudices out there. Those are of the devil and God is not happy with anyone who thinks of anyone of any other race or creed or whatnot as lesser than they were all equal under all of us, every single human being. And I think a lot of people when they die are going to be shocked to find out that they they're not superior. <laughs> it's going to be a really uh, shocking fact for them. So we're not denying at all the injustices in the world, but I believe what Mark is saying is if we only go through the lens of victimhood, um, and some people, of course, have been terrible, true victims, maybe not of every single crime. <laughs> like your son, yeah. Yes, but your son has. My son has. He's, yes, because of, of the every kind crime. of parents we are. <laughs> um, 
but if a person remains stuck and they can only see the world through their victimhood, that means they're only seeing the world through judgment of others at the same time. Mm -hmm. And that's a terrible place to live. It's not a place of forgiveness nor a place of power. Um, so yeah. I, I thought that was wonderful, Mark, what you said. Yeah, it's good that you added that. Yeah, I agree. Christine 100%. Bacon, would you share how people can find you? Um, yeah, sure. So, and I want each of you to tell them how to find you on your websites. And I will have a link right below here. But if you are a separated faithful, and that's what we call it in the Catholic Church, you know that Jesus said you are married until death. Nothing. Only if you can be unbaptized can you be unmarried. It's just not possible. In 2000 years, the Catholic Church has never divorced a single, has never broken a single marriage. Now, we have the annulment system, which checks to see if a marriage ever existed or not. It's a whole separate thing. There was a scandal in the annulment system. We're not there. It's not the point of this conversation. But if you are standing for reconciliation, even if you think that that reconciliation will never come, we have a community. We have a standards community. That's what you are. You are a standard. Whether your spouse is in the midst of an affair, whether your spouse has already divorced you, whether your spouse has already entered a, a fake second marriage, um, even if your spouse has gotten an annulment from the church and has entered a marriage that's considered valid by the church and you still wish to stand on your vows, look me up breakfastwithbacon.com. And of course, there's a link right here below this as well. There is a community of people who know your pain, but just like Jesus is doing right here with Countdown to the Kingdom, bringing Daniel and, and Mark together for their shows. And then I'm honored to be part with Christine's show, but all of us to say, we're just trying to do our part. There is a community for you to say, we're going to help support your marriage. And even if your marriage hasn't fallen apart yet, but it's at last Christine Watkins said, it's hanging by a thread. Give me a call. I'm going to help you with all the grace that God can give me to fight against what Satan is trying to do. We will not allow the division. We will stay together. So um, I'm not putting the direct link to that group here because it's a very intimate and private group. Everyone in that group has been vetted through me. So just so you will feel comfortable if you're in it, there are no people in that group that haven't. Um, I know the stories behind all of the. Do, I, do you guys mind me saying it started with four, four people in my living room in 2016? And here's where Satan thought he was doing good by bringing COVID. But because my meetings, which were at this point at about 25 people in my living rooms, uh, because we were forced to go to Zoom, God has blown it up and we are just under 300 standards from 40 states and 10 countries and still growing. And God has, been, and we've already had almost 20 reconciliations of people who have said, I will never get back with you. And they have. So wow. God is so good. Ah, God that is, is so beautiful. Good. Never believe the devil when he yeah. says never. He doesn't know the future. He, he pretends he does, and he does not know the future. God knows the future, and it's his. Yeah. So don't ever give up on, on what he has joined. But what God has joined, let no man put asunder. So do not give up. Please reach out to Christine. Yeah. So Daniel, you get the last one. Uh, name one thing you'd have our listeners do differently. Oh, I, I forgot. I, I forgot I hadn't gone. You touched your um, nose. You touched I, your nose. I thought that meant, yeah, I thought that meant <laughs> I didn't have to go. Um, What to do different, what to do differently. To prepare. Um. Jesus told Louisa, this is nothing to do with what we were just talking about, but this is what's coming to my mind. Um, he said something to the effect of people say that the path to virtue is difficult. And then he tells her false. It appears difficult for he who does not move. For the one who moves, it is extremely easy. So if you're sitting there wondering, oh, why am I not getting holier? Why am I always distracted in prayer? Why am I not doing this and this and this and this 800 list of 800 different piety, pious things I should be doing? Well, Maybe God already told you what you're called to do and you're not doing it. So just there, there's some sort of mission. I can't tell you what it is, but there's some mission that he's calling you to do. And maybe you're too afraid or too lazy. Just do it. And, and if you need to drink a little more coffee to start doing it, then drink a little more coffee. Whatever it takes, get into that mission because there might not be much time left for it. Maybe if you start doing your mission, you'll find the grace to become virtuous in all other domains as well. well that's a good way to take us out. Um each of these wonderful people has a website. Each of them has a, a particular mission. I know Christine's written about 318 books and she's still writing more. And Mark does constant writing on his blog. Daniel, you've just finished your third book, fourth? Um, I got a fourth. It's a uh, lot. Some, yeah. 
Right. I'm, work, I'm, I'm working on finishing it. Yeah. I'm going to have a link to each of their sites right below. So just click on it and um, you can find them. Do what the Lord is calling you to do to prepare in the way God wants you to prepare for what is lying ahead. So um, I'm just going to take it off the air with that. I would love for you to follow me on breakfastwithbacon.com, Instagram, Facebook, Rumble. Um, and I, Daniel and I did a show once before saying you aren't always going to find us, any one of the four of us out here, because censorship is very real. So I would encourage you to bookmark each of their sites. And when you one day notice that you're not seeing them here on this presence, you can go directly to them and say, hey, have I missed anything? Which is actually what I do with you, Daniel and Mark, when um, we weren't seeing you on this platform anymore. Mm -hmm. So found you still listed on the nowword.com as well as Countdown to the Kingdom. We can find you there. And yeah, Christine, of course. Heating up. Yeah. And Christine, of course, Queen of Peace Media um, as well. So um, I didn't even tell you guys how I end my shows. I'm hoping each of you has been on it long enough to remember. I remember. You remember? You got it. So you you can shame the others if they forgot. So I am Dr. Christine Bacon. You've been watching Breakfast with Bacon. And I'd like to remind you always to live your life. Hard boiled. <laughs> medium, over easy. Medium poached. It's medium poached. <laughs> eggs, 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 a show on perseverance <laughs> is over easy. Sunny, Sunny side, side up, up, guys. Sunny side. Oh, right, right. right. <laughs> Be sunny.